Hi class, this is your instructor, Skylar Huff, and we're now in chapter 57. This is Biological Diversity and Conservation Biology. The Cross River Gorilla, Gorilla Gorilla Delhi, was discovered early in the 20th century. It was eventually identified as a fourth subspecies of gorilla and second member of the Western Lowland Gorilla family. This rarest of all great apes lives in a small group, or at least in small groups, in highland forests of Nigeria and Western Cameroon. Cross River gorillas, listed as critically endangered with an estimated population being about 300 individuals, are rapidly facing extinction primarily due to habitat loss caused by human destruction. Local people have cut down or destroyed much of the forests for lumber, cattle grazing, and agriculture. The gorillas have been hunted and poached for bushmeat. The World Wide Life Federation The World Wildlife Federation reports that these gorillas also lack, also face the risk of inbreeding and loss of genetic diversity due to their small population size and the low rate of genetic exchange between the different subpopulations. The World Wildlife Federation has partnered with the Wildlife Conservation Society and the governments of Nigeria and Cameroon to protect the fragile Cross River Gorilla groups by establishing a forest sanctuary, enforcing laws, and supporting government management of the Campo Ma'an National Park in Cameroon and a surrounding buffer zone. Both Cameroon and Nigeria are working with local people to educate about the sustainable use of forest resources and to promote the alternative sources of income, such as tourism. Plans for the survival of the Cross River Gorillas will focus on developing protective corridors of forest habitat that will allow safe movement of gorillas between different groups to increase genetic diversity. So, with this all being stated, humans are very closely related to gorillas, both in our evolutionary development and genetically. In 2012, researchers reported in Nature that when the Western Lowland Gorilla genome was sequenced, it was only 15% of, of the human genome was more closely related to gorillas than to chimpanzees. Scientists also confirmed that the gorilla is about 98% genetically identical to us. So, taking all that into account, class, it's further that we share some rapidly evolving genes with gorillas, which may facilitate medical research of some elements such as heart disease and dementia. And the study increases our understanding of human evolution. And according to researchers, it connects us to a time in our existence which was more tenuous and in doing so highlights the importance of protecting and conserving these remarkable species. So before I get to that, what I'll say class is that the Cross River Gorilla decline underscores how humans have negatively affected the biological diversity. In an example, it's according to the International Union of for the Conservation of Nature, the IUCN, which monitors the status of Earth's biological diversity, that one fourth of the world's mammals are at risk of extinction. Our recognition of this serious situation and our efforts to address the damage we have caused may well be what ultimately ensures our own human survival. So in this chapter, we're focusing on the declining biological diversity and conservation biology, and we'll also discuss deforestation and climate change and two major environmental issues that negatively affect biological diversity. So, with all of this being put forth, the human species, Homo sapiens, has been present on Earth for an approximate 300,000 years. That is a brief span of time, 
compared to the age of our planet, which of course is over 4.6 billion years old. Despite our relatively short tenure here on Earth, our biological effect on species is unparalleled. Our numbers have increased dramatically, reaching an approximate 7.5 billion in 2017. And we have expanded our biological range, moving into almost every habitat on Earth. So the term Anthropocene was suggested in 2000 by a Nobel Prize winning scientist, Kretzing, to describe the geological epoch in which we live. So the Anthropocene, or the age of humans, is defined by the transformation of humans have affected. For example, our planet now has strata that include plastics, concrete, elemental aluminum, and other materials, and human-produced radioactive isotopes. So the concept of advancing from the Holocene to the Anthropocene is being debated by an international group of scientists. Will scientists recognize this concept? If so, how will it be described? So with all this being put forth, class, wherever we have lived, we have altered the environment and shaped it to our needs. In only a few generations, we have transformed the face of Earth, placed with a great strain on Earth's resources and resilience, and profoundly affected other species. So as a result of these changes, we must all be concerned about the environmental sustainability meaning our ability, the environment's ability class particularly, to meet humanity's current needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. So the effect of humans on the environment merits special study in biology, and not merely because we ourselves are humans, but because our impacts on the rest of the biosphere is so extensive, even to the point of causing species to become extinct. So extinction class is the death of a species, occurring when the last individual of a member of a species dies. Although extinction is a natural biological process, human activities have greatly accelerated it. So according to the 2005 Millennial Ecosystem Assessment Report, extinction is happening about 1,000 times more rapidly than the normal background rate of extinction. So researchers estimate that dozens of species become extinct each day. And many of these species have never even been identified. So the burgeoning human population has forced us to spread to almost all areas of Earth. And whenever humans invade an area, the habitats of many plants and anim animals are disrupted or destroyed, which can contribute to their extinction. Recent examples of human extinction in the early 21st century include the Javan tiger, western black rhinoceros, the Pyrenean ibex, and for most wind clouded leopard. Like the flame dodo and carrier pigeon of previous centuries, these animals were hunted or poached until the species could no longer survive. Many hundreds of animal species no longer have viable populations needed to survive due to habitat loss, pollution, hunting, and even global warming. In the United States alone, tens of thousands of species of plants are listed as endangered or threatened due to overgrazing, habitat lost, from land development and climate change. So next up is biodiversity or biological diversity. It is the variation among species and biological diversity includes much more than simply class what is known as species richness. The number of species of archaea, bacteria, protists, plants, fungi, and animals. It includes class meaning biological diversity or biodiversity, all ecological levels of organization from populations to ecosystems taking into account genetic diversity, that genetic variety within a species, both among individuals within a given population and among geographically separate populations. So biological diversity also includes ecosystem diversity. And with ecosystem diversity, it's the variety of ecosystems found on Earth, the forests, the lakes, the deserts, prairies, coastal estuaries and, and coral reefs, and other ecosystems. So biologists must consider all three levels of biological diversity, meaning species richness, genetic diversity, and ecosystem diversity, as they address that human impact on biodiversity. In this example, it's that disappearance of populations, meaning a decline in genetic diversity, that indicates an increased risk that a species will become extinct. So 
So biological biologists perform detailed analyses to quantify how large a population must be to ensure a given species long-term survival. It's that smallest population that has a high chance of enduring into the future, i.e. that minimum viable population. So with all of this information class, we must have that biological diversity. Without it class, species will continue to become extinct and of course disappearing from Earth for good. So with this being the case, just keep in mind that the legal definition of an endangered species, as stipulated by the United States Endangered Species Act, Endangered Species Act is a species in imminent danger of extinction throughout all or part, throughout all or a significant part of its range. So unless humans intervene, an endangered species will probably become extinct. Whereas a threatened species would be, of course, a species likely to become endangered in the foreseeable future throughout all or a significant part of its range. So endangered and threatened species represent a decline in that biological diversity. As the numbers decrease, their genetic diversity is severely diminished. So endangered and threatened species are at a greater risk of extinction than the species with greater genetic variability because of the long-term survival and the evolution that, that depends on the genetic diversity. So endangered species have certain characteristics in common. And those characteristics class just speak to class that they include class having an extremely small range, requiring a large territory, living on islands, or having low reproductive success, needing special breeding areas, or even class possessing specialized eating habitats. So with this in mind, endangered species have, have that small range which makes them particularly prone to extinction if their habitat is, is altered. So species that need extremely large territories may become threatened with extinction when all or part of the territory is modified by human activity. And then many endemic island species are endangered. These species often have small populations that cannot be replaced by immigration if their numbers decline, and because they evolved in isolation from competitors, predators, or even diseased organisms, island species have few defenses when such organisms are introduced by humans. So it is not surprising that nearly 200 bird species that have become extinct in the past few centuries, over 75%, lived on islands. So for a species to survive, its members must be present within the range in large enough numbers for males and females to mate. Endangered species often have very low reproductive rates and highly specialized feeding habit, habits in dangerous species. So with all of this in mind, species become endangered and extinct for a variety of reasons, including the destruction or modification of habitats, and of course the production of pollution including greenhouse gases that cause climate change. Humans also upset the delicate balance of organisms in a given area by introducing invasive species. So, so, so it's those invasive species which compete with or are pathogenic to the native organisms. Overexploitation through overfishing, hunting, and poaching also pose that act. So with this, you can see here, class, the interactions between the direct causes of declining biological diversity and those indirect human factors, such as human population increase, or increased technology use, or even increasing economic activity, and even that the social, political, and cultural factors all of these factors are contributing class to that decline in biological diversity. So to save species, what, what must be done is to protect their habitats. And, and getting to this, it's most species are, are facing extinction today because of their destruction 
the fragmentation or degradation of the natural habitat. So building roads, parking lots, bridges, and even buildings, clearing forests to grow crops or graze domestic animals, and logging forests for timber all take a toll on that natural habitat. Draining marshes converts aquatic habitats to terrestrial ones, whereas building dams and canals floods terrestrial habitats. So it's because most organisms require a particular type of habitat, habitat destruction reduces their biological range and ability to survive. So humans often leave small, isolated patches of natural landscape that roads, fences, fields, and buildings completely surround. So in ecological terms, when I refer to this island, when we refer to this island, it refers not only to any land mass surrounded by water, but class. It also refers to an isolated habitat surrounded by an expanse of unsuitable territory. Accordingly, that small patch of forest surrounded by agricultural fields and or suburban lands is considered an island. So habitat fragmentation is that breakup of the large areas of habitat into the small isolated segments, i.e. islands, is a major threat class to that long-term survival of many populations and species. So species from the surrounding developed landscape may intrude into the island habitat, giving that edge effect, whereas rare and wide-ranging species that require a large patch of undisturbed habitat may disappear altogether. And then, of course, habitat fragmentation also facilitates the invasion of invasive species, disease organisms, and other weedy species, making it difficult for organisms to migrate. So, so with that, it's general that habitat fragments support only a fraction of species found in that original, unaltered environment. However, much remains to be learned about precisely how habitat fragmentation affects specific populations, species, and ecosystems. So human activities that produce acid precipitation and other forms of pollution indirectly modify habitats left undisturbed in the natural state. So it's acid precipitation, also called acid rain or industrial precipitation, that has contributed to the decline of large stands of forest trees and to the biological death of many freshwater lakes. So acid rain is especially problematic in Eastern Europe and around industrial regions of China. So, of course, as that pollution seeps and weeps out, that wasteland then has those industrial plants and even radioactive contamination, which adversely affects the organisms. And, of course, here, this shows class. Percentage loss to predation as to, of course, seagrass environment. So there we are, patch. So this is showing you the effect of habitat fragmentation in a shallow marine environment. So what was done here is the question was asked, how does habitat fragmentation affect predation of juvenile bay scallops in a marine environment? And they found that the lowest rate of predation occurred in the continuous, the continuous seagrass meadow, which you all can see there. And the highest predation rate occurred in the very patchy environment. So it was also more difficult for the predators to intrude from surrounding areas into the seagrass meadow. So now we're getting into, of course, biotic pollution. So to save native species, it must be that controlled intrusions of invasive species to occur. So biotic pollution is the introduction of foreign species into an area where it is not native. As that occurs, it often upsets the balance of the organisms living in that area and interferes with the ecosystem's normal functioning. So unlike other forms of pollution, which may be cleaned up, biotic pollution is usually permanent. The foreign species may prey on native species or compete with them for food or habitat. 
So an invasive species, of course, is a foreign species that causes economic and or environmental harm. I say again, an invasive species is a species that causes economic and or environmental harm. You will have to describe invasive species in your test. And not just what an invasive species is, but also what is an invasive species. And of course, their effects, which I'll continue to in a moment. And along with that, you should describe class the effects of a named invasive of your choice. So the reason class that invasive species are invasive is because generally speaking, that for competitor, that foreign competitor or predator lacks any local competitors or predators, meaning that invasive species has no natural agents, no parasites, no predators or competitors, as I mentioned, that would otherwise control them. So without shared evolutionary history, most native species are typically less equipped to cope with that invasive species. Although foreign species sometimes spread into new areas on their own, humans are responsible class for such introductions, either knowingly or accidentally. So with that class, examples are the zebra, the zebra mussel in the Mississippi River, as you're seeing here, the zebra mussel, as found in the Mississippi River, or even class sheep and even pigs on the Hawaiian Islands, or even goats. For instance, the zebra mussel. It's native to the Caspian Sea. And it was introduced by a Eurasian ship that flushed ballast water into the Great Lakes in 1988. Since then, class, this tiny, notice how large it is compared to that hand. Notice how large it is compared to that hand there and the fingers. So this tiny freshwater mussel, which clusters in extraordinary densities, has massed on hulls of boats, piers, buoys, and water intake systems, and most damaging of all, on native clam and mussel shells. So the zebra mussel's large appetite for algae, phytoplankton, and zooplankton is also cutting into the food supply of native fishes, mussels, and clams, threatening their survival. So this mussel class, the zebra mussel is now found in 29 states, parts of Canada, and throughout the Mississippi River, and its tributaries, and in the lakes. So the United States spends an estimated $10 billion each year to control the spread of the zebra mussel and to repair damage such as clogged pipes. And islands class are particularly susceptible to the introduction of invasive species. As just mentioned class in Hawaii, the introduction of sheep has imperiled both the mamain tree because sheep eat it and a species of honeycreeper. That's a bird class. It's an endemic bird that relies on the tree for food. Hawaiian plants evolved in the absence of the, the herbivorous mammals and therefore have no defenses against the introduced sheep, pigs, goats, and deer. So over-harvesting is also an effect. So other human activities, of course, that affect it. So sometimes species become in danger or extinct as a result of the deliberate efforts to eradicate or control the numbers. And it's often because they prey on gammals or livestock. So in the past, ranchers and hunters and government agents decimated populations of large predators like wolf and mountain lion and grizzly bear. So some animals were killed because their lifestyles caused problems for humans. And with unregulated hunting or overhunting, it's caused extinction of certain species in the past, but is now strictly, con strictly controlled in most countries. And next up will be illegal commercial or poaching, which endangers large animals such as the tiger. I almost said tiger king, but I shouldn't. So I'll stop on tiger king. But the cheetah and snow leopard, whose beautiful furs are quite valuable. Rhinoceroses are slaughtered for their horns, used for ceremonial dagger handles in the Middle East and for purported medical purposes in Asian medicine. Elephants are poached for their ivory tusks. Bears are killed for their gallbladders, which Asian doctors use to treat ailments ranging from indigestion to hemorrhoids. And even bushmeat from wild animals 
including rare primates, elephants, anteaters, and great apes, is sold to urban restaurants. So although laws protect these animals, demand for their products on the black market has promoted illegal hunting, particularly in impoverished countries where the sale of contraband products can support a family for months. And even sharp finning, which is of course the removing a shark's fin and throwing the animal back in the ocean to die, has caused a third of the world's shark species to become endangered. And this is according to the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. That's the IUCN. So it's those fins just mentioned that are sold to China and other Asian countries for shark fin soup, or even medicinal purposes. So one million sharks were reportedly harvested in 2012. So sharks play an important role in maintaining ecosystems, and many are keystone species, as you all have learned about. So unfortunately, world shark harvests seem to be increasing despite bans on finning as people are consuming more shark meat. In most countries, at a ban finning, harvesting the entire shark is not illegal. So next up to commercial harvest. So it's the collection of live animals from nature, and most commercially harvested organisms end up in zoos, aquaria, biomedical research labs, circuses, and pet stores. For example, several million birds are commercially harvested each year for the pet trade class. Many, however, die in transit, and many die from improper treatment in their owners' homes. At least 40 parrot species are now threatened or endangered, in part because of commercial harvest class. So although it is illegal to capture endangered animals from the wild, a thriving black market exists, mainly because collectors in the United States, Europe, and Japan pay large sums for these rare birds, as you all see right here. So these caged orange front conures are native to Mexico and Central America, part of the illegal animal trade. So commercial harvest also threatens plants. Many unique or rare plants have been so extensively collected from the wild that they are now classified as endangered, including coniferous plants, wildflower bulbs, cacti and orchids. So on to conservation biology. So this class is the study of how humans impact organisms and the development of ways to protect biological diversity. So conservation biologists develop models, design experiments, and perform field work to address a wide range of questions. For example, what are the processes that influence the decline of in biological diversity? And how do we protect and restore populations of endangered species? If we're able to preserve the entire ecosystem and landscapes, which ones are most important to save? So conservation biologists have determined that a single large area of habitat of supporting several populations is more effective at safeguarding an entire endangered species than several fragments, each capable of supporting a single population. Also, a large area of habitat typically supports greater species richness than several habitat fragments. So conservation is more successful when the habitat areas for a given species are in close proximity rather than far apart. If an area of habitat is isolated from other areas, individuals may not effectively disperse from one habitat to another. Because the presence of humans adversely affects many species, habitat areas that lack roads are inaccessible to humans are safer than human accessible areas. So according to conservation biologists, it is more effective and ultimately more economical to employ landscape scale conservation strategies to preserve intact ecosystems in which many species live than to try to preserve individual species. So conservation biologists generally consider it a higher priority to reserve areas with greater biological diversity. Which gets us to class two problem-solving approaches. 
that conservation biologists employ to save organisms from extinction. They are class in situ conservation and ex situ conservation, which you will see both on your test and describe both on your test. So in situ conservation includes establishing parks and reserves, concentrating on preserving the biological diversity in nature. So a high priority of in situ conservation is identifying and protecting sites that harbor a great deal of diversity. With increased demands on land, however, in situ conservation cannot preserve all types of biological diversity. Sometimes only ex situ conservation, only ex situ conservation can save a species. In that case, it conserves individual species in that human control setting. So this includes captive breeding, captive breeding in zoos, and storing seeds in seed banks of those, of course, genetically diverse plant crops, which are, of course, just two examples. So I would say it this way that in situ conservation is the best way to preserve biological diversity. And with that, it's, it's happening in nature. So most nations have set aside areas for wildlife habitats, such as natural ecosystems, that offer the best strategy for long-term protection and the preservation of biological diversity. So currently, it's more than 160,000 national parks and marine sanctuaries, wildlife refuges, forests, and other areas that are protected throughout the world. And nearly 15% of the world's land area is protected, but only 3% of the world of the ocean area is set aside. And unfortunately, class, many protected areas have multiple uses that sometimes conflict with the goal of preserving species. National parks provide for recreational needs, for example, whereas national forests are used for logging, grazing, and mineral extraction. And the mineral rights to many wildlife refuges are privately owned, and oil and gas and other minerals are developed. <clears throat> Mineral development has occurred on some wildlife refuges. So protected areas are not always an effective strategy to preserve biological diversity, particularly in developing countries where the biological diversity is greatest because there is little money or expertise to manage them. And another shortcoming class is that many are lightly populated mountain areas, such as the tundra or the driest desert places that have seen that have often spectacular scenery, but relatively few kinds of species. So in reality, such remote areas are often designated reserves because they are unsuitable for commercial development. So in contrast, ecosystems in which biological diversity is greatest often receive little attention. And in setting such, more protected areas are urgently needed in the tropical rainforests and the tropical grasslands and savannas of Brazil and Australia. And the dry forests are widely scattered throughout the world. So desert organisms, desert organisms, excuse me, desert organisms class, are under protection in Northern Africa and Argentina, and the species of, of many islands and temperate river basins also need protection. So with this being the case, many of these unprotected areas are Part of what bi biologists have been divided as one of the world's 36 biodiversity hotspots. So your textbook class says 36. This presentation class says 25. Let's stick with 36. So the hotspots collectively make up an approximate 2.3% of Earth's land, which, of course, this is your textbook setting such, but I see this as 1.4. So you all know for a fact, I'm not going to ask that on your test, meaning how much. But of course, they contain more than half of all vascular plant species, nearly 43% of all the world's endemic mammal, bird, reptile, and amphibian species, and a quarter of the world's human population class live in these hotspots. Hmm. So with that being the case, class, these areas are in dire need of protection. So with landscape ecology, class, setting of landscapes connects that heterogeneous landscape consisting of multiple interacting ecosystems. And by studying such, it's this that's needed because those forest fragments do not maintain the ecological integrity. So it's by way of landscape ecology and 
And I say landscape ecology, it's just studying those multiple interacting ecosystems. So biologists are focusing efforts on preserving biologi biological diversity in landscapes. So it's by these long-term ecological studies. And by studying those class, it's then known. And seeing class in this figure, you just shown that one hectare and 10 hectare plots of the long term, about 30 year study under, underway in Brazil at the effects of fragmentation on the Amazonian rainforest. So plots with an area of 100 hectares are also under study, along with identically sized sections of intact forests. So as I mentioned that, and keep in mind class that a hectare is about two and a half acres, about two and a half acres is a hectare. But it's interesting to see it class in this way, because as this occurs, even in class here in Alabama, there are multiple effects of, of course, clear cutting an area. So habitat corridors, of course, are just that. So with those strips of habitat, it, yes, allowing the wildlife to move about so they can feed, mate, and recolonize areas. But just keep in mind that it's the case that sometimes class animals will not go class from this area into that area. And those animals class that are here would be restricted class of this small island, all because, of course, that patch. So with restoration ecology, it's, of course, the way in which principles of ecology are used to return a degraded environment to one that is more functional and sustainable. And as you're seeing here, class, it's by way of that buffer. So by, by use of that buffer glass, it allows the areas to, yes, be protected, but that core is protected class by way of the buffer zone that is used for environmental education, ecotourism, recreation, even research. So it's these buffers that exist that ensure class that that national parkland does exist and is protected class thereafter right around the area. So along with restoration ecology, it's shown here class in the tall grass prairie. And this has been done class in the 1930s from research by way of the University of Wisconsin-Madison that over time class, as I guess I'll say the tall grass prairie was, many species class disappeared. And as they disappeared, they went in class using, yet again, those principles of ecology to return this degraded environment to one that is more functional and sustainable. And now class, over 300 species have been restored here. So what next? We get to, well, I've already gotten class to exit your conservation. But yes, this is what happens, class, in those zoos, in which class you may have visited a zoo before. Whereas you pay that money for, of course, entrance to that zoo, you're helping class to ensure that those animals remain and, of course, not lost for good. So next up, class, will be the Endangered Species Act. So this was passed in 1973. And... As it was passed, this is what protected those endangered and threatened species here in the United States and abroad. And most other countries now have similar legislation. So as it happens, it provides legal protection to the listed species, reducing their danger from extinction. So this act, of course, makes it illegal to sell or buy any product made from an endangered or threatened species and requires officials class to select critical habitats and design a recovery plan for each species listed. That plan includes an estimate, an estimate of the current population size and an analysis of what factors contribute to its endangerment, and then a list of activities that may help it recover. So this act is one of the strongest pieces of environmental legislation in the United States, in part because species are designated as endangered or threatened made entirely on biological grounds. So economic considerations cannot influence class the, the designation of being endangered or threatened. 
So with that, fewer species became extinct than would have had the law not been passed. But it's also been a very controversial piece of environmental legislation because it does not provide class compensation for private property owners who suffer financial losses because they cannot develop their land if a threatened or endangered species lives there. So with that being the case, just keep in mind, class, that once an organism is listed as endangered, however, it has an excellent chance for survival. And over 99% of species protected by the Endangered Species Act currently survive. So this class gives an overview, and this is of as May 2017, of those species that are listed. And that's a lot of species. A lot of species. And keep in mind, looking at this list compared to that list, I say that to pay particular attention class to the list here at flowering plants. Nearly 1,735 species. And even class crustaceans. So please keep in mind class, that should be corals, not corals. All righty then. So with the national conservation strategy, and by way of the Convention on Biological Diversity class, it just requires that nations inventory their own biological diversity and develop a national conservation strategy for managing and preserving biological diversity of that country. And, I, and that'll be about all that I'll say there. So get on down to deforestation. So it is the most serious problem facing the world's forests and their biological diversity. So that is that permanent clearance of large expanses of forests for agriculture and other uses. So between 2000 and 2010 class, forests have declined at about 5.2 million hectares a year. And that's equal to the size of Costa Rica. And that's the majority of the world's remaining forest landscapes are tropical rainforests and boreal forests. So when these forests are destroyed, their valuable ecosystem services are no longer available to the environment or to people who depend on them. And that includes us. So deforestation increases soil erosion and thus decreases soil fertility. Soil erosion causes increased sedimentation of the waterways class, which harms downstream aquatic ecosystems by reducing light penetration, covering aquatic organisms, and filling waterways. Class, this is even a problem here, class in Alabama by way of the Mobile Bay. So uncontrolled soil erosion, particularly on steep deforested slopes, causes mudslides that endanger humans' lives, property, and reduces the production of hydrologic power as silt builds up behind dams. And in drier areas, class deforestation can lead to the deformation of deserts. So it's this class called deforestation that contributes to the loss of biological diversity. Many species have a limited range within a forest and particularly in the tropics, making the species of especially vulnerable to habitat destruction or modification. And the migratory species, such as birds and butterflies, who also suffer from tropical deforestation when original forests are destroyed and biodiversity is greatly diminished, such as those monarch butterflies who make that trek class from here to Mexico each year. So if trees are subsequently, replant, subsequent, subsequently replanted, the level of biodiversity increases very slowly and it is unlikely to approach the previous levels of biological diversity. So deforestation class, it also increases global temperature by releasing carbon stored in trees into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide, which enables the air to retain heat. The very same way class, it's, it's the carbon in the forest that releases the, that's released immediately if the trees are burned or more slowly when unburned parts decay. So deforestation is responsible class for that approximately 15% of all greenhouse gas emissions. So if trees are harvested and logs removed, roughly one half of the forest carbon remains as dead materials, the branches, the twigs, the roots and leaves that decompose releasing carbon dioxide. So when an old growth forest is harvested, it may take 
200 years class, replace the forest to accumulate for the amount of carbon that was stored in the original forest. So there you have it, class. So the tropical rainforests, meaning most of the remaining unstructural rainforests, and the Amazon and Congo River basins of South America and Africa, and in Indonesia, continue to be cleared and burned at a rate unprecedented in human history. So several studies show a strong statistical correlation between the population growth and deforestation. More people need more food, more fuel. So they clear forests for agriculture and the expansion and burn wood for personal use. However, tropical deforestation cannot be attributed simply to population pressure. The main cause class varies from place to place and a variety of economic, social, and governmental factors. So, although tropical deforestation is a complex problem, the immediate causes of deforestation in tropical forests are subsistence agriculture, commercial logging, commercial plantations, for of course palm oil, sugarcane and bananas, and cattle ranching. And subsistence agriculture class in which a family produces enough food to feed itself accounts for nearly half of tropical rainforest deforestation. And in many developing countries where tropical rainforests are located, many people do not own the land on which they live and work and must clear the forest to grow food. And then of course with <clears throat> slash burning agriculture, which of course is the subsistence farmers that often follow the loggers' access roads to cut down trees, burn the area, and plant crops immediately. Of course, yields from the first crop often are quite high because the nutrients that were in the trees are now available in the soil. But however, a few years later, soil productivity declines and the farmer must move to a new part of the forest to repeat the process. Cattle ranchers often claim that the abandoned often claim the abandoned land because it can still support livestock. So slash burn agriculture carried out on a small scale with periods of 20 to 100 years between cycles is sustainable. The forest regrows rapidly after a few years of farming. However, when millions of people try to obtain a living on this way, the land is not allowed to lie uncultivated long enough to recover. So globally, at least 180 million subsistence farmers obtain a living from slash burn agriculture. There you all can see it. It's 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 dark. It is stark. So of course the boreal forests are harvested primarily by clear coat logging and are the world's primary source of industrial wood and fiber. Canada's biggest timber exporter is such. Logging in Canada class is uns unsustainable. About two and a half millions of canyon forests are logged annually. So as your harvested class, well, they're at risk. And the biodiversity is significantly reduced. So from this happening class, we're losing forests all over the globe. Finally, class, the last section here is climate change. So rapid climate change imposes stresses on many living organisms and can lower biological diversity. So the Earth's average temperature is based on daily measurements from several thousand land-based meteorological stations around the world, as well as data from weather balloons, orbiting satellites, trans-oceanic ships, and hundreds of sea surface buoys with temperature sensors. The 1990s was the warmest decade of the 20th century, and the early 2000s continued the warming trend. 16 of the 17 warmest years have been recorded since 2000 class. Earth's rapidly changing climate imposes stress on many living organisms and is already having a negative effect on biological diversity. Scientists worldwide have studied climate change for several decades. As the evidence is accumulated class, a strong consensus was reached that the 21st century will experience a significant rapid climate change and this change has been caused mainly by human activity. So it's, by and large class, human-produced air pollutants that has caused most of the climate change and increased ocean temperatures observed during the prior 55 years. So global surface temperatures increase likely to exceed 
2.7 to 3.6 degrees by the year 2100. In addition, class, global ocean will, will continue to warm, which will affect ocean circulation and likely undergo further acidification. So it's global warming that is melting the ice and expanding seawater. So with that being the case, class, sea levels will rise more rapidly during the 21st century as shrinking glaciers and melting ice sheets increases rapidly. So as a result, Earth will likely become warmer during the 21st century than it has been for several million years. Let's get to greenhouse gases. So to provide you all with a line of best fit class, there it is. You can say class over time, that mean annual global temperature class has increased. So here we are, class. Greenhouse gases cause climate change. The World Meteorological Organization recently reported that 29% increase in the warming effect of greenhouse gases between 1990 and 2010. And if you're wondering, what do you mean? Well, it's carbon dioxide has accounted class for 80% of this increase, CO2 class. So it's carbon dioxide, which is CO2, methane, which is CH4, nitrous oxide, N2O, are three of the most prevalent and long-lived greenhouse gases, excluding water vapor. Surface ozone, which is O3, and the hydrochlorofluorocarbons class, that's HCFCs, also continue to accumulate in the atmosphere as a result of human activities. So the concentration of atmospheric CO2 has increased class by nearly 40% since the start of the industrial era in 1750. So with that being the case class, it's just look at pre-industrial levels compared class to, of course, the present levels. So climate change occurs because greenhouse gases absorb infrared radiation, or heat, in the atmosphere. This absorption slows the natural heat flow into space, warming the lower atmosphere, and so that heat class from the lower atmosphere is then transferred to the ocean, and then rises its temperatures as well. So this atmospheric retention of heat is a natural phenomenon. Because carbon dioxide and other gases trap the sun's radiation, somewhat like a glass does in a greenhouse, the natural trapping of heat in the atmosphere is called the greenhouse effect. And the greenhouse gases that absorb infrared radiation are known as greenhouse gases. This natural heating of the atmosphere prevents Earth from becoming a frozen planet. However, it also, meaning by the additional warming produced with the increased levels of gases produced by human activities, absorb additional infrared radiation, causing the enhanced greenhouse effect. Potentially catastrophic implications, class, as atmospheric ocean temperatures continue to rise. And you can see yet again, class, this is a line of best fit class showing you the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere between 1960 and 2017. So over time, class, there has been a great increase in the carbon dioxide concentration class in parts per million over time. So although the current rates of fossil fuel com combustion and deforestation, and deforestation are high, causing the carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere to increase markedly. Science think that the warming trend is slower than the increasing level of carbon dioxide may indicate. The reason is, is that water requires more heat to, rise, to raise its temperature than the gases in the atmosphere do. As a result, the ocean takes longer to warm than the atmosphere. So most climate scientists think that the warming will be more pronounced in the second half of the 21st century than the first half. Methane plus the gas is the second most prevalent greenhouse gas, increasing class nearly 160% since 1750. And that is mostly classed with the cattle grazing, livestock planting, and the fossil fuel exploitation, and landfills too. So human activities account for more than 60% glass of methane emissions, whereas 40% of the emissions are naturally occurring. Nitrous oxide is now the third most important greenhouse gas. Finite levels class 20% higher than 1750. So its concentration is increasing rapidly due to nitro-containing fertilizers and manure. So with that being the case, class, the effect of nitrous oxide of the past century is nearly 300 times greater than the effect of the equal emissions of carbon dioxide and its contribution 
to the destruction of the stratospheric ozone layer. And keep in mind, class, it is stratospheric ozone that protects us from those harmful solar ultraviolet rays. So to end this thing, class, let's get to those probable effects. Well, before I get to this, this was that enhanced, the enhanced greenhouse effect. Notice, class, heat goes here and back there. Notice again, class, heat goes here, then back there. So much of it, class, is radiated back to Earth. And only some is going to be reflected back. So this is again, class, showing you that we must, we must, class, have, we must have our stratospheric ozone. We must have it because, as I just mentioned, class, it shields us from those harmful rays. And in case you didn't catch what I was stating, class, ozone is a form of oxygen that's human made, it's a pollutant, class. In the layers of the atmosphere, I repeat, a pollutant in the layer of the atmosphere, but a naturally produced class, a central part of the stratosphere, which is an approximate 6 to 28 miles above the Earth. So please keep in mind, class, that it's, it's for us, but it also depends on where it is. And this is showing the Dobson units class of ozone layer. And you can find this class on page 1,259. So this is a computer-generated image class from part of our southern hemisphere from 2015, showing that the ozone is thinning in the blue and purple areas. And this is over Antarctica. So the probable effects class of climate change, well, changes in sea level and precipitation patterns, the effects on biological diversity, and even the effects on agriculture. I mean, these effects may persist for centuries because those greenhouse gases can remain in the atmosphere for hundreds of years. So even after the greenhouse gases have stabilized, the surface temperature class may continue to rise because of the ocean adjusting to climate change and the delayed time scale. So sea level may rise. And of course, as it does rise, class, well, there will be places that are now, I guess you say, land that will likely be water, such as class in Louisiana and South Florida. Climate warming, meaning the change in our precipitation patterns, more frequent droughts, yes, more frequent droughts, heavier snowstorms, or even class rainstorms with more frequent flooding, and likely class generating more powerful storms because of the warmer sea surface temperatures, and even the effects on organisms class. So it might be, of course, that plants will shift their range. They may be class more restricted class, or they may even class be more restricted depending upon the plant. And of course, plants cannot walk. Animals can move. Animals can migrate. And of course, by way of climate change, so as those species are, they may be class confined to, I guess you say, more of this island. And not an actual island, but I mean, be more restricted class to a smaller area. So it may also threaten class, polar seas, coral reefs, wetlands, Coastal wetlands, the tundra, the rural forests, tropical rainforests, and mountains. And of course, those weeds may, of course, prosper. They may, of course, extend their range, the pest species, too, and even disease causing organisms. So, with that class, heat rated deaths for the elderly, among others, will likely be those most affected, even class in India. Lots of people will go, of course, not necessarily extinct, but lots of people class there will be dying because of the temperature increasing there even if it's just one degree Celsius. And with agriculture class, there will be a, a shift, meaning the rising sea level class will inundate those river deltas and be some of the world's best agricultural lands. And in some areas, class, because of drought, they will no longer class be able to grow those crops there. So those are the probable effects of climate change. I said probable effects. So... The future, we hope that somehow, some way, we can find a way, class, to live more sustainable. Because the fate of our future generations and of the biosphere depends on our willingness to learn and make informed decisions. So this has been your interpreter, Skylar Huff, prepare well for the test class. And thank you all for listening.